for a class or you know you're not going to be here one day, um, I can just record the lecture. That's usually not a problem. In fact, I might start getting into the habit of just recording lectures when people are absent, just because I know you hire you're absent for a while. So if people are absent, I might just start recording. Hell, I might just record them every day. Yeah, I might just start doing that. It's not hard, so. Whatever. Initiative. Initiative is the um, first state level reform. And initiative, uh, simply put, means the people may introduce a bill. The people may introduce a bill. Now, a bill is not a law. It's a proposed law, right? So if you want something to become a law, you have to introduce a bill first. The problem is that up until this point, who introduced all the bills that might become laws? Politicians, Congress, bosses, um, the corrupt, right? Typically, the politicians were corrupt. So might they be passing laws that we, the people, liked or wanted? Probably not. So the initiative process created by the states gives the people the opportunity to pass laws. As a result, does that make people more empowered? Sure, it gives us more opportunity. Here's the problem, though. Suppose that we do create a bill. Is it likely that the people in the government of the state, is it possible that they won't pass our bill? It is, right? So what if the people really want it? What if the government isn't doing what we want? Well, we're not going to take over, but we're kind of taking some powers back. And one of the other powers then given to the people is something called referendum. Referendum is another power given to the people of the states. And what a referendum is, is that it allows people to vote on bills. It allows people to vote on bills so that they could potentially become what? Laws. Is this a huge power to give the people? when we give the people the ability to vote on bills. Because up until this point, who were the only people allowed to make laws? Again, the politicians, the corrupt, boss, uh, political bosses. But now the people have the opportunity to make laws. Sir? Huh? Today? Yeah, we vote a lot of things like this today through the initiative and referendum process. But is this the only way we make laws in this state? No, I mean, Congress and the State Assembly and the House Senate, I mean, the California Senate, they still make laws. However, do we now engage in a lot more lawmaking ourselves as the people? Yeah, yeah we now make a lot more laws um, because we feel that maybe our government wouldn't do it uh, on our behalf. Yes, sir. No problem. Next one, folks, is recall. Can we use your room Wednesday for a meeting? Wednesday evening? Evening? Sure. Uh, before we get to uh, recall, real quick, uh, initiative and referendum. Initiatives are created by the people. Referendums are voted by the people. Does that mean that an initiative will automatically become a law through referendum? No, it does not. Here's why. An initiative typically, folks, in the state of California needs 250,000 signatures in order to get on the ballot. Okay, so in order for an initiative or an idea that you and your friends come up with, in order for that to even be considered becoming a law, in California it needs about 250,000. It might be different in different states, but in our state it's 250,000. The reason why that's important is that, let's say you and your friends decide, oh, we want to make the California flag the color you know, orange. That's going to be our new flag. So you and your friends decide you want that, you and your five friends. Is that going to be on the California ballot? No, because that's only you and your friends. But if 250, exactly, but if you have 250,000 people sign a petition saying you want this to become a law, then will it be entered onto the ballot? Sure, and then the rest of the state will consider it. Makes sense so far. Now, on the day of voting, we have a referendum on that initiative, and you need 50% plus one. Now, is it possible that, let's say, 4 million people vote in that election? Let's say in 2012, 4 million people voted in the state of California, assuming that's the number. Is it possible that four, like 2 million people may not like your bill? Sure, and then it could get voted down. 
Because it's not like we needed 4 million people to approve the initiative. We only need a small margin. But you need 50% in order to actually make it a law. So two really good examples, folks. Legalization of marijuana is something that's constantly trying to be promoted uh, by uh, medical users, recreational users. And you see this ballot come up all the time, right? And they likely are able to get enough uh, petitions to sign the ballot and make it an initiative. However, has it become a law? No, because there are more people in the state of California, typically parents, who believe that this is not a law that they want. So even though, let's say, a large minority of people want it, do the majority want it? No, and so therefore it won't become a law. So that's just the way it works. Ah, that's a good question. Even if they legalize marijuana in the state of California, does that make it legal? No, because it still violates federal law, which brings us back to the age-old debate between Jefferson and Hamilton, which is more powerful, state law or federal law. The state law supersede federal law, it depends on who you talk to, but like I said, even in 2013, is state power versus federal power still the major debate? It's still something that goes on today. Yeah. If it passes the state, the state may not enforce it. But the federal government, for example, the FBI, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Explosives Bureau, they might also arrest you. So for a while in the state of California, at least in San Francisco County, they had legalized rec uh, medicinal marijuana. But they were raided by the FBI. And so because it violates federal law. So what we can say is, I don't care what state law says. The federal government is still higher. But it's up to the federal government to decide what laws they want to enforce. For example, if the city of La Puente said jade walking is no longer a crime, but the state of California says, oh yes it is, what are you talking about? It's up to the state of California to come to the city of La Puente and decide whether or not they want to enforce it. If they don't enforce it, then people are going to jaywalk, right? But if they do enforce it, then technically the state of the California is in the right because they're a higher power. They do and they don't. But it depends on what policy, which is example. Jaywalking is rarely ever enforced in La Puente, but in major cities it is enforced. It just depends on where you are. But does that make sense though, folks? It's just higher law versus lower law. Uh, the other issue then that gives more people power is recall. Recall is the power to vote someone out of office. The power to vote someone out of office. Typically, folks, when you try to impeach someone, you impeach someone through politicians, right? The problem is, what if the guy that you're impeaching that's corrupt is being impeached by other people that are corrupt? Is it possible that they won't remove him? They might keep him because that's their best friend. And so, recall allows the people to get past all the corruption. So in the state of California, about 10 years ago, we recalled Governor Gray Davis because we believed that he was not doing his job and he was replaced by Arnold Schwarzenegger. But that's why Arnold Schwarzenegger became governor because we recalled Governor Gray Davis. I believe it was Scott Walker in one of the states earlier last year. Uh, he was almost recalled. Uh, I think it was Michigan or Wisconsin where they almost recalled him because they were unhappy with what he was doing in his state. So it's one of those things where you can vote someone out of office if you find that they're not exercising their power properly or if they're corrupt or they're just not representing your interests. Yeah? I'm sorry? Uh, you, we cannot recall presidents. Remember, these are state-level reforms. So we can recall our governor, but that's the highest office that we can go in California. In order to remove a president, they must still be impeached through the Constitution. But in the state of California, you need 51% or 50% plus one to recall a governor. So pretty much if the majority of people are unhappy, you can recall the governor. And again, it's happened once in California as far as I remember. I mean, it happened in my lifetime. It happened in your lifetime, too. You guys were just really young. I think it was 2003 or 2002. Yeah, you guys are about six years old when it happened. Um, but yeah, no, it's happened before and it can happen again. Yes? Pretty much there were two votes. Uh, you voted for a new governor and you voted to recall. So pretty much you had to vote twice. 
do you want to recall Governor Gray Davis? You vote yes or no. On the second one, who do you want to be governor? You can vote for Gray Davis again. Or you can vote for, there was like 30 candidates that ran that year. Well, was like Arnold just like book spot or like No, Arnold ran as a serious candidate. He ran as a serious, he ran for the Republican Party as a very serious candidate. What was his opening statement? I forget. No, I mean, he, he actually uh, advertised he was running on the Jay Leno show. But he gave a pretty good argument about you know, he was a moderate Republican. He felt that this this state needed more you know Republican values and you know cutting spending. So he made a pretty good argument for. He definitely won because he was a Hollywood star. But he wasn't a horrible governor. He probably wasn't my choice for governor, but he wasn't a horrible governor. And so I think he actually did a fairly decent job, not a great job. He didn't destroy the state, is what I'm saying. So there's that. The other type of reform, Australian secret ballot. The Australian secret ballot. Uh, so these are not ballots that were mailed to us from Australia, but we were inspired by what Australia was doing in their ballots. One of the key reasons why this was important was, one, now you could vote in secret. Imagine back then if you were voting and you had to come up to a central table and then you would say, uh, so Robert, who are you voting for? And out loud you say, well, I'm voting for Obama. Got it. President Obama for Robert. Put it on the board behind me. And then Joey, who are you voting for? Well, I'm voting for Mitt Romney. All right, Mitt Romney for Joey. Put it on the board. Is that, is that secret? It's not a secret vote. And so could you be intimidated by your employers or whatever else? Your, your boss might say, if you vote for this guy, I'm going to fire you. So they said, we got to make it more secret. The second thing the Australian secret ballot did is that it got governments to print the ballots and not political parties. It got governments to print ballots and not political parties. Here's why. Do some parties control different regions of the country? California, for example, is dominated by who? The Democrats. Texas is dominated by the Republicans. So imagine my party dominates this city. And I'm going to create the ballot for the upcoming mayoral election. And so here's the ballot I make for this election. Okay, there are two candidates. There's my candidate of the King Party. Or there's your party, we'll just call that the Lame Party. And uh, the Lame Party. <laughs> All right, here's your ballot. Who are you going to vote for? Obviously, the nice, happy looking one. Or I could also say, oh no, they messed up the ballots and they forgot to put you guys on it, and the election was yesterday. That's horrible. Well, maybe next year we'll fix it. But did political parties have an interest in printing the ballots unfairly? Sure. So ultimately what they said was, we can't do that anymore. That's just not good. Is that what, is that what, like, the state, huh? Yes, that's why you have to pay states to be put on the ballot because there's a printing cost to be able to be put on the ballot. Uh, so ultimately, this is why people now have to pay to be able to run for office in every state. And that's the primary reason why. Because if we had the political parties do it, of course political parties would make their own ballots for free. Because they would do this. They would make it so that, you know, the guy on top was the best candidate, and the donkey and the other one was like, you know, dying or whatever. So <laughs> it's just important that we have this. Uh, we also fought for what becomes known as the direct election of senators in the 17th Amendment. And in the 17th Amendment, which is passed, it says that who will now directly elect senators? People. The people will now directly elect senators. Does anyone know who elected senators before from the state of California? President. Not the president. They're not they were appointed, but not by the president. In the state of California, who might appoint senators for California? The government, the government of California. So before it was the state legislature. With the 17th Amendment, the people could now elect their senators. So in the original Constitution, could people directly elect their senators? In the, back in 1787, could people directly elect their senators? 
No, they couldn't. And why might we not want people back in 1787 to be able to vote directly for their senators? Because back then, people are what? Corrupt, uneducated, stupid, uncivilized, what have you, whatever you want to describe them as. But they're not ready. But now, in 1913, do we have public education? We have Lyceum movements and Chautauquas, and we have McGuffrey readers, and we have public textbooks. And so do we feel a little bit more confident about the American people? Yeah, and so now we say, OK, fine, the people can now vote. That's why we do it. These are your three progressive governors that emerge. They represented the three states uh, that are included. You have Fighting Bob Robert LaFollette of Wisconsin, Hiram Johnson of California, and Charles Evan Hughes of New York. These are just people, if they ask you who was Charles Evan Hughes, you'll know he is a reformer of New York. Same for Hiram Johnson and Fighting Bob LaFollette. Progressive governor reformers, or progressive governors that reformed. <clears throat> yeah. The Twenty First Amendment, nineteen thirty three. We'll talk about that two units from now. It happens during the Great Depression and the New Deal. One of the major reasons why we passed the 21st Amendment is one, people are depressed, let, let them drink. And two, we can tax it. It'll make us some money during the Great Depression. So. The argument uh, for legalization of marijuana is, well, just like the prohibition of alcohol, it didn't pan, pan out very well, so maybe we can do the same thing for marijuana. So I mean, they, if you use history to make the argument, you can make an argument for it. Uh, but then the argument is, but they're not the same. They you can know? tax it, though. Exactly. I mean, again, that's the argument, is that you can tax it and therefore create uh, a revenue. But the argument is, again, they're not the same. So even if it is considered, if we want to consider legalizing it, they say it's not the same as alcohol. It could have different effects. I mean, there's also medical reasons why it's not, I would argue. Um, but again, I'm not an expert on it, so I really don't know. So, so people say that, and then some doctors of course. Yeah, I think at a certain point, it just depends on who you talk to. So it's, it's a pretty controversial issue. So I use it for as an example, not necessarily to promote or advocate or deny it. Labor reforms is one other example of progressive reforms during this time period, uh, primarily led by Florence Kelly, who was a previously a member of the Settlement House movement. Now. Florence Kelly had two goals in mind when reforming labor. The first was that she wanted to eliminate sweatshops. Who here doesn't know what a sweatshop is or doesn't have an exact definition? Okay, let me explain what sweatshops are. Um, sweatshops are typically described in three ways. Number one, they pay very low wages. I mean, depressingly low wages. If minimum wage today is, let's say, $8, they're paying you $2 an hour. Okay, they're paying very, very low wages. Number two, horrible working conditions. I mean, we're talking about no ventilation, uh, poor lighting, very hot, machines aren't safe, very, very poor working conditions. Hmm? Yeah, Cruella de Vil. And lastly, folks, very long hours. Very long hours. So again, horrible wages, horrible working conditions, horribly long hours. And ultimately, what happens here, folks, uh, is that they force you to work. If you don't work, then we'll fire you. Sweatshops still technically, or they do still exist today, especially in areas like Los Angeles County here in LA. Um, and what ends up happening is that most of these sweatshops employ illegal immigrants. And what they'll say is that, you know, you're going to work for me, you're going to work for this much, for this long, I'm not going to hear you complain about it. And if you do start complaining, like, oh, the conditions here are horrible, or you're not paying me enough, you know, I'm going to report you, they're going to say, oh, you're going to report me? I'm going to report you. 
I'm exactly. I'm going to deport you. Because, yeah, because if you want to shut down my business, then I'll deport you. So are these people willing to report on the poor working conditions that they're working in? No. And so this becomes a serious issue. Her argument was that these people were not getting paid a living wage. So should people get paid a living wage? What is a living wage again, folks? Yeah, minimum wage or just enough to survive. Typically, minimum wage is the living wage, depending on what state you're in. Uh, is the living wage in California higher or lower than the federal living wage? Lower. Higher. California costs more to live in than most other states. California is one of the most expensive states in the U.S. I'm sorry? Our, in, yeah, because of inflation. Yeah, every few years inflation will change only because you know, things are getting more expensive. But that's because as more people have more money, is your money worth less? So you need more of it to be able to buy the same things. So inflation makes the minimum wage go up. I mean, minimum wage back then was like, my dad was telling me how he used to get paid $5 an hour, and that was like really good to buy a house. Today I'm thinking, oh my god, $5 an hour? I made more than that when I was in high school. You know, so I was, I was getting paid seven twenty-five when I was in high school. And so now it's like, what, $8, $9? Like eight, dollars eight twenty-five or something. Yeah. So yeah. The other thing they try to eliminate, child labor for obvious reasons. So again, Florence Kelly really aimed to try to, again, make society better for workers. Again, end child labor, and again, end sweatshops. Yeah? How do they get those kids to let them, like their parents let them? Yeah, their parents let them. Because if you think about it, OK, look, let's say uh, you had kids, OK? And you are working in a job that already pays you very little. You can barely feed yourself. So if you want your child to eat, your child has to work. That's what it comes down to. I don't have food for you. I'm sorry. Which is why what happened to the birth rate in America at this time? It dropped drastically. It dropped drastically. Guys, uh, you guys may not know this, but actually there was a report recently that the, uh, the, the percentage of young adults in California has dropped steadily by 20% in the last 50 years. You guys now own, young adults now only account for like 33% of the population in California when it used to be like 57 that people are just having fewer and fewer kids. Just because is it hard to have a lot of kids? It is. You, maybe you have two to replace you know, the family, but otherwise you have one or two kids. My family had four, but still it's not very much. So uh, some of the other successes uh, were Moeller v. Oregon. Are these, the, the... these are Supreme Court cases. Shh. In the Supreme Court case of Moeller v. Oregon, what happened in the case uh, was that it ruled that women are limited to a 10-hour workday. Women are limited to a 10-hour workday. Now, many of you might think, well, that's great, Mr. King. Isn't that what they were fighting for, 10-hour workday or 8-hour workday? That's better than 18-hour workday. So you're right. Actually, this was kind of good for women. It limited women to a 10-hour workday because some women sued saying, my boss is forcing me to work 10 hours or no, 30 hours, a, 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 no, maybe 18 hours a day. I said, you can't do that. So the Supreme Court said, you're right. Women may, are, are limited to a 10-hour workday, so people can't force you to work more than 10 hours. Sounds great. Unfortunately, there is a negative side to it. The argument for why women could only work for 10 hours a day was sexist. The argument was women can only work a 10-hour workday because they're frail and weak. Men can still work more than 10 hours, but women can't because you're a woman. I mean, come on, you're so weak and uh, frail. You'd probably break after 10 hours. You have babies, so clearly a problem. So, I mean, is it kind of a victory for women? Sure. But the argument for why was like, oh, we got it. Wait, for what reason? Because we're weak? Ah, I don't really agree with that, but I'll take it for now. You know, yeah, exactly. It's a backhanded victory. It's a, it's a what's that uh, the term that they use? A pyrrhic victory. A pyrrhic victory. You lose a little while winning. It's like you win, but at what, at what cost? Uh, so there's that. So yeah, uh, it limited women to 10-hour workday, which means women are weaker. Also the problem, 
Women could not choose to work more than 10 hours. They had no option to work more than 10 hours, which is a problem because might some women want to work more than 10 hours? Might they want to provide for their kids? But by saying you can't opt to work more than 10 hours, well, that kind of takes away choice for women. You know, what if you want to work an extra three hours you know, to buy that new Xbox for your kids? Well, I'm sorry you can't do that because of Muller v. Oregon. Cool. Then there's Lochner v. New York, another Supreme Court case. And what this said was that you can't limit men to a 10-hour workday. You can't. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. You can't limit men to a 10-hour workday. But you can't, oh, yeah, that's right. You can't limit men to work, you can't limit men to a 10-hour workday, but you can't force them to work more than 10 hours either. Okay? You can't limit men to a 10-hour workday, but you can't force them to work more either. Yeah, so after 10 hours, you're done. You can go home. So this was also considered a goal. But if men want to work more, can they? Yes, women can't because they're weak, but men, they can do it because they're men, is the argument being made. So here's the problem, though, with that. Again, intended to be good gives people more freedom of contract is the term that they use. Men now have choices. Men can now choose to work if they want. That's technically considered a victory for labor. The problem is employers found a loophole around that, and they said, you know what, you're right. I can't force you to work more than 10 hours. So imagine, let's say you work at Walmart. Okay, it's, uh, You work 10 hours already. You're just putting the clothes back on the rack. It's 10 o'clock. Oh, 10 hours. Uh, boss, I'm going to go now. It's 10. I know I haven't finished putting away all the clothes, but it's 10 o'clock. I'm going to clock out now. So the boss is going to say, oh, but you didn't finish putting away the clothes. Like, well, yeah, but it's 10 o'clock. I work 10 hours. I'm going to go home now. Well, OK, you can go home. I just thought that you were the type of worker that was willing to go the extra mile, and you really cared about the company. But if you're the type of worker that's you know, just going to work only the minimum and then go home, then I think we're going to have to let you go. Because I want a team player. And I want a worker that's willing to give our company 110%. So am I forcing you to work more than 10 hours? No. But what I'm saying is, if you don't, uh, maybe you can find another job because I'm gonna find someone who is willing to work that much. Many companies have been sued by employees recently because of this. You can't do that. You can't coerce your employees to say, oh, well, I guess uh, we're gonna have to find someone else who's just more committed to the job. That's blackmail. You can't do that. So if your employers ever do that in the future, sue them because you're not allowed to do that. You work for the hours that you're required, and then you go home. Now, that's hourly. If you get paid salary, you work as much as expected of you. So for me, I'm salaried. If I go home, am I still working? No. Yeah, I am. I still have to take work home. I grade essays when I'm at home. Now, I get to choose what I want to do at home. But if I have to grade papers, might I still have to do it at home? Sure. I mean, they can't make me do that. But is it expected of me? Because I'm a salaried employee. Yeah, so it's like they're not paying me for hours at home. But they're paying me for like the entire experience of being a teacher. Everyone get this one? It does not apply to women. Then we try to fix child labor with the Keating Owens Act of 1916. They thought child labor is reprehensible, it's horrible, it's terrible. We must end it. Because otherwise, has she a fair chance? No, she doesn't. So we pass a law called the Keating Owens Act, which said uh, they prohibited the transportation of products or goods made with what? Child labor. They prohibited the transportation of goods made with child labor. And why might this result in the end of child labor? I mean, how is this going to help end child labor? Yeah, because no one's going to buy or no one can, can buy it because they can't ship your goods. So the idea was, well, we're going to get them because now no one can buy the goods because are you allowed to transport your products? No, because it's made with child labor. No one wants to buy it. No one can actually buy it either because it's not being shipped. 
So this was considered a really good way to end child labor by ending demand for child labor. However, in the Supreme Court case of Hammer v. Dagenhart in 1918, Supreme Court ruled, I'm sorry, but you can't do that. The Supreme Court case of Hammer v. Dagenhart overturned the Keating Owens Act. And it's not that the Supreme Court was in favor of child labor. They're not like, oh, whoa, child labor is awesome. What are you talking about? You can't do this. No, it's not that. The argument is that the Keating Owens Act violated interstate commerce laws because transportation of goods across states is interstate commerce, right? And you can't pass those kinds of laws restricting that type of product. So they said it overturned the Keating Owens Act because it violated interstate commerce. And what they said was, look, if you want to end child labor, then don't pass laws about transportation of child labor goods. Just pass laws that what? End child labor. If I'm saying, you know what, we should not serve pizzas at La Puente High School, my law should not be, you can no longer transport pizzas on district trucks going to La Puente High School. Why even do that? Why not just pass a law that says, no pizza at La Puente High School? They did it the wrong way. Yeah. They, they passed a law that violated interstate commerce. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, I agree with what you're trying to do, but you can't do it like this. That's unconstitutional. So by all means, go pass another law. Just not this way. You can't do it this way. Yeah, it worked for a little while. But they said, look, figure out another way. You can't do it like this. Cool? Cool, cool? Then there's a triangle shirt waste factory fire. Uh, this was a sweatshop, uh, I believe, in New York, and it caught on fire. We learned a lot of lessons from the triangle shirt waste factory fire. What happened was that uh, a fire broke out in the eighth story of this uh, building where the factory was. And a lot of things we learned became a problem. Number one, the women could not escape because there were no fire escapes. So you can't you know, run out the window and climb down the stairs. There were no fire escapes. That's kind of a problem if you're all the way up there. Because, I mean, if you can't go out the window, then you can only go out the front door, right? So that's an issue. You only have one exit. You can't have that. You must have at least two exits in a public building like this. Secondly, the doors were chained shut. Not just locked, like deadbolt, like chained, shut. Now you might wonder, Mr. King, why were they chaining these women in this factory? Number one, it's a sweatshop, so they don't you know, want them to be able to leave. But two, uh, they didn't want women to leave for their smoke breaks or to try to sneak out, so they literally chained the doors shut. That's a problem. So is that going to delay some time trying to undo the doors? That takes some time. Three, there's no fire sprinkler system. That's a problem. It's not like most buildings had them anyway, but still, it's something that we realize, how can we stop fires more efficiently? But there's no fire sprinkler system. Isn't the water and like you said, It's disgusting. Doesn't it take all the water from the area? Yeah. It takes, all, I mean, in most places now where they do have fire sprinklers, like when I was in college, there's always water in the pipe, so it's like faster. Um, when those fire sprinklers go off, it is disgusting. It smells horrible. Because that water's usually been sitting there for a really, 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 they're, they're just water ready to go. But they just, it just sits there. And again, if there's a fire, you're not going to care. But if it's a fire that accidentally goes off, and the sprinklers accidentally turn on, it's horrible. Horrible. Because not only are you all wet and all your stuff is wet, but everything smells terrible. Uh, no, we have different ways to fight fires. And also, none of this is flammable, so... I mean, that's designed to be like that. But again, doors. But the fourth problem, and you may not think this is being a problem until I explain why, the doors opened inward. The doors opened inward. Now, you might think to yourself, well, and this is something you probably never think about, but this is a serious problem when doors open inward in a building like this. Imagine if there was a fire in this classroom right now, and we decided to run out the back door. If I want to get out of this back door and the door opens inward, what am I going to have to do in order to open that door? 
I'm going to have to step back, give myself about three or four feet of clearance, and then pull the door open. But while I'm pulling that door open, what's happening behind me? People are pushing forward. And so am I going to get that door open? No. So that's a serious problem. Something you, you don't even think about that, do you? But those doors, if they opened inward and there was a fire, that would create a serious issue. And that happened. In fact, folks, about two or three years ago, there was a nightclub in India that caught fire. And over 300 people died, not because of the fire itself, but because as people panicked and began running out the front doors, they could not open the front doors because people were ramming into it. People were crushed to death between the force of all those people pushing against them, against that front door, and then people got trampled. And as the bodies began to pile up, they couldn't open the doors. And so many people died of smoke inhalation. It's just one of those things where you don't even think about doors opening outwards, but it'll save your life in a building. And actually, it's building code. You can't build doors on public buildings like this that open inward. Here's the other thing. You notice those doors don't have doorknobs. Why might those doors not have doorknobs? It's not picking locks. It's, about, it's not even that they get hot. So if we mean the fire is inside the room. Huh? Uh, kind of. You might think the doorknob gets stuck. Let me explain. Uh, when you're panicking, are you thinking straight? No. no. So when you go to a doorknob and you turn it, you actually have to turn a doorknob about three quarters way in order for it to actually open. If you don't turn it three quarters way, that doorknob is not going to release properly and the door is not going to open because the door jam is still there, right? So assume you turn the doorknob two thirds of the way. You thought you turned it all the way, but in your panic, you turned it quickly, not all the way, and the door doesn't open. So you've tried that door and you believe it's already locked. So you panic and you can't get out. And so that's a serious issue. Or let's say you're sweating and you can't grip the doorknob because you know, you're, you're, you're panicking. That's another issue. This is why we don't have doorknobs on these kind of buildings. Instead, we have those things on the door. You guys know what those are called? They're called, they're called push doors, but specifically, they're called panic bars. Those are called panic bars. Uh, sometimes they do, rarely, but they're called panic bars because it doesn't take a genius to figure out how those work. No, you could be accidentally running out the door and it'll still open because all you have to do is depress it a little bit and the doors will open. And so it's one of those situations where you don't really think about why we have these things in our buildings, but they're for a very good reason. They're designed for your safety. Yes, but that's not an egress door. That's not for going outside of a building. That's going into an office. But the building on the other side has a push bar. So there's egress and ingress. Egress is going out. If the door is for egress, then typically it opens outwards. If it's going into a room like another office, it's ingress typically, but it just depends. Because if the power is out, you won't see anything. If I turn off all the lights, you won't know where the exit is. So the exit signs are designed to be able to give you light on the way out, just like movie theaters, whatever else. It's designed for those purposes. Yeah, it's for losing power. It's not necessarily for a fire, it's just for losing power. Cool. OK. As a result of this fire, 146 women are killed. It's a pretty big death toll. Many women die in the fire. Other women die of smoke inhalation. But 146 women, many women jumped out of the, out of the building and leapt to their death because they didn't want to deal with the fire anymore, like during 9-11 in the Twin Towers. So that happened as well. And so you have that all going on. In any case, folks, one thing that we uh, benefit from this, as if you can benefit from something like this, is that we at least did begin improving safer working conditions. As a result of this tragedy, we begin to improve safer working conditions. You know, uh, you might want to make doors open outwards, provide specific, you know, door locks, fire escapes, don't chain the doors, these kinds of policies. It improved safety conditions in the workplace. Now, does this mean that every single person followed them? No, you still have sweatshops, but it's better than what it used to be. Was labor reform successful? Somewhat. Some degree, yeah. I mean, you still didn't end child labor, but did you get some other successes? So I would definitely argue that labor reform was somewhat successful. Cool. All right, moving on to black rights. You guys should know actually both these dudes. So write down the information just as a reminder. 
but both individuals will again be working for black rights during this time period, just like they did during the Gilded Age. If you need me to re-explain any of this stuff, please let me know, but I assume you guys already know who these people are and what they did. So jot it down, and then if you need a reminder, please let me know. Sir? Was Washington the one who was considered an Uncle Yes. Uh, he was the one who said that it's okay to accept segregation, and all we need to do is learn how to work. Whereas Webb Du Bois said we have to go to what? College, school, higher education, that kind of thing. I mean, the biggest help is the NAACP. I mean, this promotes college going. So Webb Du Bois is the NAACP guy. And again, Booker T wanted just money, remember? Wrestling, Booker T. The hand. Hmm? Ah. Everyone good with the slide? Mas rapido, por favor. Okay. All right, so there are a few Supreme Court cases that are considered successes for the black rights movement during this time period. The first Supreme Court success is Gin v. U.S. Basically, what the Supreme Court case did was that it banned the grandfather clause in Oklahoma. But for your purposes, just know that it banned the grandfather clause. Is that a success, folks? Yes, because the grandfather clause said that uh, what couldn't what if what? Yeah, blacks couldn't vote if your grandfather couldn't vote. So that's a pretty big deal when they ban the grandfather clause. So that's a huge success. I love this cartoon and how racist it is, though. Um, you know, hey, Mr. White Voter, have you a daughter? Suggesting if you don't continue the grandfather clause, your daughter will have to go to school with blacks. And that's terrifying. This is an argument in this cartoon. Cool, Gin v. US. Next one is Buchanan v. Worley. And in the Supreme Court case of Buchanan v. Worley, this is also a victory for uh, black rights. Because Buchanan v. Worley, how do I frame this? It banned mandatory segregation. It banned mandatory segregation. Let me explain why. Uh, that's, this is also in the state of Kentucky, for some people that are curious. What happened is that the state of Kentucky passed a law that said you have to be segregated. It's mandatory to be segregated. Blacks and whites may not coexist or go to the same schools or go to the same restaurants or at least you know, sit in the same area in restaurants. They required everyone to be segregated. Does that make sense so far? Now, were there some people during this time period that were completely okay with race issues? You know, they said, oh, I'm okay with sitting with blacks or whites or whatever. There were some people that were pretty progressive that did not mind race as an issue. And so they said, well, we want to have a school with both blacks and whites, or we want to have a restaurant that accommodates for both blacks and whites equally. And Kentucky said, what? No. You can't do that. They said, that's crazy. So they sued all the way up to the Supreme Court, which ruled you can't have mandatory segregation. Now, can people still choose to be racist? 
Sure they can. If you want to be racist and segregate, by all means do so. But can you require people to be segregated if they want to be together? No. So that's kind of a victory. It's not like we got rid of segregation, but it's kind of a victory. Now, people that want to live together can live together. Then you have Ida B. Wells, who was a muckraker that unfortunately uh, uncovered lynching in the South that most people in the North were not aware of or did not believe was happening. So Ida B. Wells, one of the other muckrakers, she uncovered Southern lynching. Uh, she didn't necessarily take this photo, uh, but this is just one of those photos that uh, would correspond to kind of what was happening. But again, uh, she uncovered Southern lynching in the South which was a horrible, horrible crime suggesting that many of these men, these two men included, were beaten and then hung simply for what? Being black because of their skin color. They did nothing wrong. And so she wrote these exposés explaining the horrible conditions of the South, and it did educate many Northerners who either did not believe that this was happening or just did not know that this was happening. Yes. Yeah, if you look at this image, there's a suggestion that some people, as if it's just not that awkward. That it's not bizarre that there are two dead men hanging from a tree. Like, it's just something that happens. It's something normal. And in reality, folks, some states in the South, Mississippi, Alabama, so the Deep South states, over 200 a year were being lynched, which is a very high death toll. And so she wanted to report on this, saying, look, I know the Civil War is over, but there's still some serious stuff going on in the South that you can't just forget about. You know, I know Reconstruction ended, but uh, clearly there's some, still some serious problems. So it was her goal to kind of uncover uh, the issues of the South. Then you have Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey was a Jamaican immigrant who created an organization called the United Negro Improvement Association. United Negro Improvement Association. And the argument uh, that he wanted to make was that blacks should go back to Africa in a good way. Not like go back to your country, but like we should go back to our country in a positive sense. Because he promoted black pride in black culture. He promoted black pride in black culture. It's kind of his big thing. Promoted black pride in black culture and said we should all move back to Africa. It's not like we're wanted here in America anyway, so what are we doing here? Let's go back to Africa. Now, have we heard something similar to this before? Yeah, the American Colonization Society and during the abolition era, these were whites wanting to send blacks back to Africa. But this is a little bit different. These are blacks saying we should go back to our country. In any case, it was mildly successful. Eventually, uh, Marcus Garvey is arrested for tax evasion, and he's deported because he didn't pay his taxes. The good side, though, was that he was creating culture or black pride for black Americans. So that was a good thing. Unfortunately, he wasn't paying his taxes. So, just that. Did he want to go back to the huh? Did he want to go back to the yeah, he himself also wanted to go back, but he was from Jamaica, so he figured, hey, let's all go together. Cool. Cool, 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 Then blacks played a role in World War I. Now, during World War I, many black Americans moved north from the south in something called the Great Northern Migration, where blacks or southern blacks moved north. And why did they, why did they move north, folks? And not just the racism, but that is part of it. And so what are they going to do? Not just land. It's not an issue of land. It's an issue of jobs. They're not going to become farmers. They're going to become factory workers. They're going to help in the war efforts. So and during the Great Northern Migration, Southern blacks moved north to work in the war factories. They operated in the war factories. And are they going to contribute to the war effort? Are they going to make guns and bullets and whatever else necessary to fight this war? Sure. So they're going to contribute to the war effort by helping in the war factories in the north. At the same time, are some blacks going to fight in World War I in Europe? Yes. Many blacks actually go off and fight in the war front in World War I as well. 
Unfortunately, despite the Civil War being over and Reconstruction supposedly completed, blacks were segregated in the military. Blacks and whites did not fight together. In fact, many white officers were so uncomfortable commanding black troops that they put black soldiers under the flag of the French and said, hey, can you lead our black soldiers because we just don't feel comfortable doing so because of the sheer racism of it all. Now the French said, sure, whatever, because the French have a long history of colonizing Africa. So they've been working alongside blacks for years. I mean, this is something not new to them. But many of the whites were like, I don't know I can do this. And many blacks served under the French flag and were commanded by French officers, which is kind of crazy and a testament to how terrible racism was during that time period, where even though we had the same enemy shooting at us, we could not get beyond the racism and had to take our black troops and make them fight with the French, which is crazy. Huh? The French still had a superiority complex, but they were more used to working with blacks already because of the French colonies that they had uh, in Algeria, Morocco, whatever else. And so they're used to it already. Americans are still getting used to it. Remember, we had slaves for a very long time, and France had already like gone, done away with it. So it's an uncomfortable relationship that Americans have with slaves, whereas France is totally cool with it. They're like, no, blacks are fine. We have no problem with them whatsoever. Now, they fought in the war. They contributed to the war factories. So did they give during World War I? They provided. They, they supported. And so just like women, is there an expectation that they should get compensated for the efforts? Now, women got the right to vote, so isn't there an expectation that blacks should also receive some type of compensation, maybe ending Jim Crow or something? They'll give them more rights because we feel like, hey, we fought. Why not? Well, let's read this uh, short uh, statement by Webb Du Bois, and you can tell me uh, what happened after the war. We are returning from the war. The crisis and tens of thousands of black men were drafted into a great struggle for bleeding France and what she means and has meant to the last drop of blood, for America and her highest ideals. We fought in far hope for the dominant Southern oligarchy entrenched in Washington. We fought in bitter resignation. For the America that represent and gloats in lynching, disfranchisement, case, caste, brutality, and devilish insult. For this, in the hateful upturning and mixing of things, we were forced by vindictive fate to fight also. But today we return. This country of ours, despite all its better souls have done and dreamed, is yet a shameful land. So they fought in the war. And when they came back, what did they come back to? The same thing. They're still lynching. They're still gloating about it. And the frustration that Webb Du Bois had is that we fought for this country and all of its ideals, but technically, what else were we fighting for? Our rights. Well, we wanted to be fighting for our rights, but as we're fighting for our rights, we're also fighting for your right to continue lynching, gloating, you know, disenfranchising. Because we fought, but did any of that change? So technically, we fought to maintain that system. And they're frustrated about that. What, why did we fight in the first place if all was going to happen was we were not going to get the democracy that they got in Germany? What did we gain from this? And the argument is nothing. And so when you look at it, folks, the question is, was there success for black rights? And the answer is little to none. Okay. Yes, we got Gin v. US. Yes, we got uh, the Worley case. Um, yes, blacks have moved north and are at least more public in their appearance, but there's still some significant problems. Jim Crow is still an issue. Segregation is still an issue. So was there success for black rights? Some, but not nearly a lot, or not nearly as much as they deserve. Yes? Oh, yeah, totally racist, Jim Crow. Totally racist, Dumbo. The crows and Dumbo, they're called Jim Crows. Yeah, yeah you know, they speak in like that racist black speak, like they're jive talking because Disney believes that's how black people speak. Totally racist. Jim Crows. They're called Jim Crows. Yeah. His name is Jim Crow in the Dumbo movie. Think about that for a second. Yeah, go watch Dumbo again. He'd be like, what? If, uh, if, if, if I teach civics this summer and you guys take civics with me, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Disney and how crazy Disney is. Let's talk about the progressive presidents, T.R. Taft and Wilson then. Moving on to the presidents. 
Up until this point, folks, the progressive reforms that we talked about were promoted by who? Who created these reforms? Women, the people, us. Now, the reforms we're going to be talking about next are spearheaded by who? The president. So there are kind of different levels, but they're all national or state level reforms. The people did the first four or five that we talked about. Now these are presidents that are saying, while you're doing that, I'll do this. So they're kind of working in tandem with each other. So the progressive presidents, T.R. Taft and Wilson. The first president is President Theodore Roosevelt, 26th president of the United States, serving from 1901 to 1908. Now, how did he become president again? McKinley died. How did McKinley die? He was assassinated. By who? Leo Kazakzabznov. 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 Whatever. Leo. He was killed by Leo. Leo Kazakzabznov. So that guy killed him, and he becomes president. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? I saw it on History Channel, but I did not watch it. Was it any good? Oh, I'll, I'll DVR that then again. Then see, there's a History Channel is doing the Ultimate Guide to the Presidents. Uh, it's likely that it's not very good, but it's I'll take a look at it. Yeah, it was the the powder keg ammunition blew up. I uh, sometimes know more than they do, but anyway. 1901 to 1908, first progressive president, and here are the many faces and roles of T.R. over time. He was a cowboy, a historian, a police commissioner, naval secretary, a rough rider, governor of New York, vice president, president, peacemaker, and a mighty hunter of all time. That's yep, he, he serves many roles as a man. You think to yourself, what have I done in my lifetime? Like, uh, what? He's a movie star? Maybe. He's a role model for sure. Teddy Roosevelt decided, when I am president, or now that I am president, I want to use the presidency as a bully pulpit. I want to use the presidency as a bully pulpit. Now, what is a pulpit? Anyone remember what a pulpit is? Know what a pulpit is? Where can you find a pulpit? Huh? No, not orange. It's pulp. <laughs> A pulpit is a platform that priests or uh, ministers use at church. That's a pulpit. A pulpit is a platform where you can preach. And so he said that the presidency would be a bully pulpit. Uh, what he meant by that was that he would use it as a platform to promote progressive reforms. He wants to use it as a platform to promote progressive reforms. If you ever go to church or in churches, the priest or the minister will deliver their sermons from a pulpit, like the highest level where they give their sermon. That's called a pulpit. Here, he said the bully pulpit will serve as a platform to promote progressive reforms. A pul uh, platform to promote progressive reforms. And so he said, I suppose my critics will call that preaching, but I have got such a bully pulpit. Now, other fun fact, bully Bully back then was slang for awesome. It was slang for awesome. So I suppose my critics will call that preaching, but come on. I have got such a bully pulpit. Awesome pulpit. I got such a great platform to permit, present change. If, let's say, the Panama Canal was just built, President Roosevelt, we just finished the Panama Canal. Well, bully. Bully, that's awesome. Bully. That's kind of how that works. You should bring that sling, slang back, guys. No. Yeah, be like, oh, man. Uh, what'd you get in the test? I got a hey, bully! <laughs> or bullying is not bully. Mm, see what I did there? I chose bullying, which is a serious concern, and said bullying is not bully. All right. So, uh... Using his bully pulpit, Teddy Roosevelt established his progressive agenda for his presidency, known as the three C's and the square deal. So conservation, focusing on the environment, corporate regulation, square deal, and consumer protection. Make sure you guys have the three C's and square deal, then we'll move forward. So the three C's and the square deal are the issues that he is going to promote as president of the United States. <clears throat> 
Everyone got this? Almost. A few more. It's okay if you miss it because the headlines are the same headings, consumer protection, whatever, so we can just move on. Everyone good? Bully. I'm going to start using it. And then everyone's going to use it. You're like, where's that from? Like, history? Conservation was the first task that Teddy Roosevelt wanted to tackle. Not really the first, but it was one of the things he wanted to tackle. New Lands Reclamation Act was passed by Teddy Roosevelt, and the goal of the New Lands Reclamation Act was to irrigate the western states. Now who here can tell me what it means to irrigate the western states? Yeah, to bring water to. How are we going to do that? By building canals, dams, what have you. Rerouting rivers, that kind of thing. I mean, look at Las Vegas, folks. Las Vegas is in the middle of where? It's a desert. There is nothing there but Las Vegas. And if we did not build Hoover Dam, do you think Las Vegas would be there? Absolutely not. They're in the middle of a freaking desert. But because of things like irrigation systems, what have you, you can begin to have people move further west. So is this going to be good for America? Yeah. yeah, you start irrigating, more people can move out west. Because at this point, there's a lot of land still, but can people live there? No. no. So with irrigation, you can start having people expand in areas that were uninhabitable before. So awesome. Next thing that he passed was the Forest Reserve Act. And the Forest Reserve Act, folks, set aside 150 million square acres one hundred fifty million square acres for what? Forests might be included in them, yeah. Animals. Animals will be in them as well. Like a, a National Park. National Parks. Very good. Forest Reserve Act set aside 150 million square acres of land for national parks, like uh, Yosemite and Yellowstone. Because he's really into nature, folks, because the argument is that if we don't save nature now, is it possible that his great-great-grandchildren will not have this beautiful scenery around us? I mean, that's the biggest fear that we have today in LA, right? That there are places like the hiking trails that will disappear by the time you, know, you get older, you have kids. And so, I mean, if we keep building, you know, I grew up in Walnut, and there used to be times where there were just patches of just cows everywhere. Because, you know, they just had cows growing over there. And now, it's staples. You know, now it's like 24-hour fitness. But before, it wasn't there. Cows would, I mean, you would drive to the freeway, you see cows all over the hills and whatever else. And so, society is urbanizing, which is fine. But do we have to protect some of the pristine environment that we have? What, have, what made America beautiful and still needs to remain. Also, here's Teddy Roosevelt riding a moose. That moose? Uh, no, they're huge. Meese are gigantic. <laughs> There's a lot of them. This is just one of many meese. Uh, meese can be violet, but this individual moose is not. Just trying to make sure you guys understand how to do this grammatically. Plural of moose is meese. Plural of goose is geese. Actually, I don't even think that's right. I think it is mooses. Yeah, plural of moose is mooses. Never mind, I was wrong. Goose is geese, moose is mooses. Yeah, plural of uh, house is houses. Plural of mouse, mice. English is dumb. Then there's the first teddy bear, which is not important, but still you might want to know where it came from, right? Because teddy bears are named after Teddy Roosevelt. Fun story. Shh. Here's what happened. So Teddy Roosevelt went out hunting one day because he wanted to hunt a bear as he's a hunter. He's a game hunter. And he went out hunting and he could not find one. And for three days he's like, where's this bear? I want to hunt a bear. I want to shoot a bear. But he couldn't. And so he kind of you know, took a break and he sent his other hunters out to go find one. And they did find one. And they attacked it with dogs and they wounded the bear. And they trailed the bear for another two days or so. And eventually they caught up to the bear and they chained it to a tree. Wounded everything else. So they said, President Roosevelt, we got a bear. And they brought him over to the bear and the bear was trained to the tree. And he said, what? This? I cannot shoot this poor defenseless creature. No, I can't. He turned away and said, you let that bear go, because I'm not going to shoot this. This is not a game. That bear is hurt and injured. That is not 
why I'm here. And so he turned away and he saved that bear's life. And many children heard the story like, oh, that's so cute that he saved a bear. And from then on, the teddy bear was named in honor of Teddy Roosevelt who saved bears. I'm sorry, who saved a bear. And the reason why I say that is that he then looked over and said, that bear is suffering. It is injured. It will die. We need to put it out of its misery. He didn't hunt it. He had someone put it down because it was suffering. So they named Teddy Bears after Teddy Roosevelt because of all the good that he did saving that one bear. So they named it after him. Uh, lest we forget, he did hunt other bears later. <laughs> so it's not like... Yeah, it's like if I'm like, oh, Mr. King, I'm so happy that you didn't eat that one French fry. Ah, I fell on the floor. It's not a big deal. No, no, no. King fries. Because you did not. No, no, it's fine. I really, it's not a big deal. King fries, sir, for you. At some point, then I eat all the other fries. Like, well, I'm going to eat these fries, though. I hope you don't mind. No, no, no. King fries. They're your fries. In any case, folks, uh, furthermore, passing on conservation, there is corporate regulation. We feel at this point it's time to tackle the problems built during the Gilded Age. He's going to try to take care of what problem? The problem of what? Trust. We're going to tackle the problem of trusts. And he can do so because do we already have a, t a tool to tackle trusts? We do have a tool to tackle trusts. Which tool is that tool? the Sherman Antitrust Act. It was built and designed to tackle trust, but did we use it during the Gilded Age? Not for trust. What did we use it against? We used it against labor unions. So Teddy Roosevelt, progressive president, says, you know what? I'm going to destroy trust in America. I'm going to break them. I'm going to become a trust buster. I'm going to bust trust, which is a real term that we used back then. He was a trust buster. Now, by the way, I want to make things clear. When we bust trusts, I don't mean we're getting rid of it completely. I mean we're breaking it up into smaller companies. Does that make sense to everyone? We're not just eliminating all of steel in America. Instead of having one large company, it'll now be broken up into like 30 different companies or 10 different companies. No, they're all going to be run by different people. They're going to sell it off to different owners. He'll still make money from the sale, but he won't run them anymore. He'll make the profit, but that's it. He can't continue to operate it as one company anymore. Is that clear with everyone? That's kind of what happens all the time. Like, you know, Microsoft became too big, they broke it up into two divisions. You know, Google might eventually get too big, they might break it up into two divisions. Motorola might get too big, they'll break it up into two or three divisions. This happens periodically throughout history. Anyway, he becomes a trust buster, and one of his here is the Sherman Antitrust Act, by the way fighting for its life against all those trusts who don't like it. And he busts the first trust. The first trust that this trust buster busts is Northern Security <laughs> Trust. Uh, I can't, but the trust, this trust buster busted the first trust. Uh, the first trust that this trust buster busted was Northern Securities Company Trust. So Northern Securities Company was a railroad trust, and it was busted by Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and this was one of the big dogs. This was a powerful trust because it was run by J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller. Are these some of the most powerful people in the country? And he took them on. He said, I will bust your companies because your companies are not good for the American people. I mean, what are some of the complaints of trusts, folks, if you guys can remember? Like railroad trusts or steel trusts. I mean, what are the problems? High prices, maybe poor working conditions, maybe unfair competition. And so they decide to bust trust. Interestingly enough, he doesn't just bust this one. He busts about 44 plus other trusts. Sugar trust, meat trust, fertilizer trust, iron trust, coal trust, rubber trust. All other trusts are being busted by Teddy Roosevelt. Is that a bear? That is a bear. That's a badger. Yeah. In any case, folks, is he becoming pretty aggressive against these trusts? Yes, he really wants to destroy them, and he does so. Furthermore, folks, he goes on and he further regulates railroads through the Elkins Act. And what the Elkins Act did was that it made railroad rebates illegal. What's a rebate again? It's a discount of sorts. Uh, now, are rebates in and of themselves illegal? 
No, they're fine. You get rebates from Staples all the time. However, when the rebates are secret, are they illegal then? Yes, it has to be public knowledge that everyone has access to said rebate. So he made railroad rebates illegal. That definitely hurts the railroad companies because they made all their companies that way, money that way. And also the Hepburn Act. The Hepburn Act. And what the Hepburn Act did here was that it strengthened the ICC, or it gave more power to the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission. It gave more power to the Interstate Commerce Commission, or ICC, if you don't know what it is, to regulate railroads. It gave more power to the ICC to regulate railroads. Now, the ICC has been around since 1887, so why didn't they regulate railroads back then? Corrupt. They were corrupt. Right, government was controlled by railroads and trusts. But now, with the Hepburn Act, the ICC is given power, more power, to regulate railroads. Now they can take more action. Now they can investigate more. Now they can ask for more documents. It becomes a much more powerful agency. By the way, what is interstate commerce? Commerce that what? Goes between the states, right? Goes across the states. Just remember that. TR did have a philosophy, though. TR did have a unique philosophy, and he believed in some. He believed in the difference between good trusts and bad trusts. He believed that bad trusts should be what? They should be busted. Bad trusts should be busted or eliminated. But should all trusts be busted? No. He believed that there were good trusts. Some of these trusts actually lowered prices for people. Some of these trusts were actually more efficient. And so according to Teddy Roosevelt, what should we do with good trusts? Not necessarily reward, maybe kind of reward them, not necessarily support. What is he doing here with a good trust? He's not protecting him. He's regulating him. He believes that good trusts should be regulated. Now, can we reward them if they do well? Sure. Should we support them to be good? Sure. But he says not all trusts should be busted. Good trusts should be regulated. Bad trusts should be busted. Is that clear with everyone? So there's a difference, he said. Some trusts are actually good for America. Others are terrible. And does this cartoon pretty, do a pretty good job kind of explaining that? What did he do in this cartoon to the bad trust? He shot it in the face, I'm assuming. As for the good trusts, what did he do? Yeah, he put a leash on them, right? He regulated it. And then there's another teddy bear that's carrying all of his guns, which is weird, but why not? That's the bear that he saved. Yeah, the bear's all over the place. There he is right there. Uh, he's not there, but he's not. Oh, I guess, no, that's not him either. Uh, no. He's right there. There he is. It's like Where's Waldo, but with bears. <laughs> anyway, so Teddy Roosevelt did a pretty good job tackling these trusts because is he kind of fighting these massive giants of industry? I mean, talking about Fisk and Gould and Rockefeller and Morgan and Carnegie. These are the most powerful men in America, and Carnegie said, I'm going to take you on. So it's a very awesome picture of him you know, taking on the giants of American industry. And he wins for the most part. So that's kind of impressive. Oh, yeah? Cool. Then there's also Square Deal. Blockhead. Which I found uh, earlier this week, and I thought, did they have Minecraft back in 1900? <laughs> Minecraft, by the way, being a game, it's like Legos for the internet. But I thought, like, that looks very similar to Minecraft, and it's not. Uh, it's a game. If you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. But if you, does anyone know what Minecraft is? Like five people? Cool. I don't enjoy it, but you know, I know what it is. Anyway, Square Deal. Square Deal was a policy that Teddy Roosevelt had. And it was the policy of giving a equal deal or a fair deal. He wanted to give a fair deal to business, labor, consumers, and the government. The square deal wanted to give a fair deal
to businesses, consumers, labor, and government. Because on a square, how do you define a square? Four right angles, because that's going to help us. <laughs> Wait, squares don't have six sides. Cubes have six sides. I'm talking about squares. Squares, the basic definition is all sides are equal, right? And yes, you have to have right angles as well. Otherwise, OK, but yes, you're right with the four. But I mean, you have to have four equal sides, hence a square. If you don't have four equals, if you have four equal sides, but you don't have right angles, what is it? Oh, it's a rhombus. Uh, rhombus. Anyway, square deal, equal for all peoples. He wants to make sure that everyone gets a fair deal, a square deal. Cool so far? Huh? What's in the other corner? Democratic corner. Like, who's going to fight me next? He'll probably win. I mean, regardless. I don't care who he fights. Teddy Roosevelt's going to. Anyway, here's when the square deal is used. In 1902, you have something called the anthracite coal mine strike. Anthracite's just a type of coal, so you can just know it as the coal mine strike. But anthracite is, you know, the name of it. So if you want to be historical, then you know, use the right name. People are like, remember the coal mine strike of 1902? Anthracite coal mine strike? I do. I do know about the anthracite coal mine strike. Kind of just jab them. Why don't you know what it is? It could have been another kind of coal, so why don't you properly title it? The miners go on strike. The miners want a 20% salary increase, and they want a eight-hour workday. So they want a 20% salary increase and an eight-hour workday. They want a 20% uh, 20 salary increase and an eight-hour workday. That's what the miners want. By the way, if someone's going to give you a 20% raise, like for changing jobs, for example, you should take that. Because typically, you get a raise of about 2% a year, depending on where you work. On average, it's about 2%. And if you don't, uh, if you have to wait 10, if you have to wait, you have to wait 10 years in order to get a full 20% raise, uh, change jobs, provided that you like the job, they're giving you a 20% raise. Because otherwise, you have to wait 10 years to get the same amount of money. So if someone offered me 20% more, which no one will in the teaching profession, because all jobs are about the same then you should likely take it if you like the job. I mean, that's just advice for the future. My fiance just got offered a job where it increased her salary pretty significantly. And we thought about, OK, well, how many years would you have to work at the current place in order to get the same amount of money in the future? And it was like 10 years. I'm like, well, OK, well, then let's, let's get another job for you, because that's crazy. So just think about that, folks. Typical rate of inflation is 2%. If they give you 2% every year, that's about fair. But if someone is going to offer you like a 10% raise, you'd have to work five years in the same place to get the same amount. So something to think about in the future. Put me on speed dial. You can call me when you ever. That's my guy. Anyway, the strike wasn't a serious problem until winter came. Why? It got really cold, and the people wanted coal. Why? Yeah, to, to heat their homes, because they're freezing. So they said, Roosevelt, go take care of it. We're freezing to death, and they're still on strike. So Roosevelt invited both parties to the White House to negotiate a deal. Okay? Roosevelt invited miners and owners to the White House to negotiate a deal. At the White House, where he invited miners and owners, he proposed the following. Roosevelt at the White House proposed a 10% salary increase and a nine-hour workday. Is that about as fair as you can get in terms of compromise? That's half and half and half and half and half. That's about as fair as you can get. Miners said, sure, we'll go with that. That's still better than nothing. And mine owner said, no. Roosevelt said, OK, OK. If you don't agree to this, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send federal troops to your mine. The government is going to take it over. And then I'm going to put these workers to work. This is significant, folks, because the president is using the military to do what? Control. Not necessarily to control people, but in the past, folks, during the Gilded Age, whenever there were strikes, we did use the military. But we used the military to do what? To yeah, to, to, to control violence, to attack labor unions. Now, the military is being used to support labor unions 
against owners. This is the first time we used real, uh, federal troops to support labor. Is society changing? We're supporting those that need, not those that have. And so he uses the military for the first time to support labor. And that's a big deal. And so do these companies want to lose their company? No, so they agree to it. The companies are forced to agree because they clearly don't want to lose their minds to the federal government. By the way, if the government takes over, let's say, your business, because they can from time to time, it's called nationalizing. Like, let's say you own an oil company. You say, you know what? You're terrible at this. I'm going to take it over. I'm going to nationalize your oil company. I'm going to take it over for the government. Maybe I'll pay you. Maybe I won't. We'll see. It just depends. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Here's some pictures. Here's Teddy Roosevelt preventing that coal strike from killing all those innocent consumers. Good job, Teddy Roosevelt. Also, here's Teddy Roosevelt killing a giant wolf that almost destroyed everyone. Good job, Teddy Roosevelt. You killed that wolf. Consumer protection. The third C. Under consumer protection, Teddy Roosevelt wanted to protect the health and safety of the public. And he was largely inspired by the book, The Jungle, by muckraker Upton Sinclair. Is anyone here familiar with the book, The Jungle? No? No, not The Jungle Book, just The Jungle. Well, if you're not, well, then this is always fun when you guys don't know what this is. The Jungle, again, is a book by muckraker Upton Sinclair. Okay, he's a muckraker. And the book is about unsanitary conditions in the meat packing industry. It's about unsanitary conditions in the meat packing industry. Well, it's the, pretty much the food industry, but specifically this book was about the meat packing industry. Um, many people always ask, how was he able to write the story? Originally, his story wasn't even about food. It was just about poor working conditions. And what happened was that he had gotten a job, like a, like a fake job, to work at the meat packing plant to see what life was like working, to see about the poor working conditions. You know, to interview like the worker, like, oh, I can write about the story after. It turned out, though, that the real story was not the poor working conditions. The real story was the unsanitary conditions of the meat packing industry. So everyone cool with that so far? Bully. So go ahead and put down your pencils. We're going to go ahead and read quickly through an excerpt from The Jungle. Close your eyes and kind of envision what we're talking about. Really just let it in. Here we go. The meat would be shoveled into carts and the man who did the shoveling would not trouble to lift out a rat even when he saw one. There were things that went into the sausage in comparison with which a poisoned rat was a tidbit. There was no place for the men to wash their hands before they ate their dinner, and so they made a practice of washing them in the water that was to be ladled into the sausage. There were butt ends of smoked meat and the scraps of corned beef and all the odds and ends of the waste of the plants that would be dumped into old barrels in the cellar and left there. Under the rigid system of the rigid economy, which the packers enforced, there were some jobs that it only paid to do once in a long time, and among these was the cleaning out of these waste barrels. Every spring they did it, and in the barrels would be dirt and rust and old nails and stale water, and cartload after cartload of it would be taken up and dumped into the hoppers with fresh meat and sent out into the public's breakfast. Let me add to that story in the excerpt that's not included here. You could enter storerooms piled high with meat in room temperature conditions, and leaky pipes would drip water all over those piles of pounds of meat. Rats scurried about wildly as if a feast was set out just for them, and workers, irritated by the rats, would put out poison crumbs, uh, breadcrumbs, wherever they could to try to poison the rats. You could wipe your hand across those mounds of meat, and you would always find large traces of rat feces wherever you went. When you would scoop and shovel that meat from the piles into the hoppers, which is what grinded that meat together, even if you saw rats, dead rats, poisoned rats, poisoned breadcrumbs, 
or who knows what else, feces, you would take that and go, oh well, dump it into the hopper and grind that all together. Yes, they would eat it too. Because they were like, this is how it's done. Peep, oh, uh, 700 people in the Spanish-American War got severely sick. So, I mean, people did start finding out. And when they found out, they're like, that's why! <laughs> but people read about this and they thought, holy crap, literally. This is terrible. And so what ended up happening was Teddy Roosevelt passed two laws. The Pure Food and Drug Act, which required proper labeling of goods. Uh, because life in there was like a jungle. It was chaotic, it was disgusting, it was gross, it was hot. Yeah? Of course he ate meat. He said he rose about Pure Food and Drug Act. And what it did was it did two things. It created the Food and Drug Administration, which you guys know is the FDA. It created the Food and Drug Administration. <coughs> and it required proper labeling or it banned false labeling, however you want to put it, but it required proper labeling for food and drugs. But it created the Food and Drug Administration, and it required proper labeling for food and drugs. Pretty much today, folks, you can't go to the store and say, you know, made from 100% juice, and it's made from, like, pee. You can't do that. Okay, if whatever it's on that label has to be in that label. That's false advertising. You can't buy cancer medication. You know, this says cancer medication on the bottle, and it's really only Advil. Okay, you can't do that. It has to be properly labeled. Yeah. Um, that because the FDA has not approved it yet. I mean, they can, but they're warning you it's not approved by the FDA. They can you sell it? Yes, free market. However, I'm letting you know right now, it's not approved. So you are taking a risk by not, by not taking FDA-approved foods or whatever. Um, that's why it's so cheap, because usually it probably is bad for you. They have it in regulations or human tests. So let's say, oh, it's fine, I'm sure. But then, you know, like the first 900 people that took it were fine. But the next 900, you know, started growing like, you know, warts and whatever. So it just becomes a problem. So FDA-approved, guys. Be safe. Then the Meat Inspection Act, pretty simple. Do I have to explain this? No. You have to inspect meat packing industry, but you should write it down. The other act that was passed was the Meat Inspection Act, where now you have to inspect meat because, holy crud, it was disgusting in there. Cool? Bully? Bully. That's good. That's right. You will engage in historical lingos by the end of the school year. Your college essays will be like, I had such a bully teacher, and then I'll get fired. <laughs> because they don't understand the 1900 lingo. Good, 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 good. All right. So the Roosevelt Panic of 1907, what ultimately happened was the panic ensued economically caused by overspeculation. However, even though this is caused by overspeculation, because you and I are intelligent and we know what causes panics, they blamed who for the panic? Roosevelt. His enemies said, you are responsible for this panic because what did he do that they argued destroyed the U.S. economy? Destroyed the trust. He busted trust. So they blamed Roosevelt for busting trusts. And he said, it's your fault that this happened. You are responsible for the panic. When we know it's just over-speculation. You know, over-speculation in railroad, over-speculation in uh, canals and dams and whatever else. Whatever. Cool? Cool, 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 cool. Don't worry about that one. That's just him, you know, doing whatever the hell he wants because he's Teddy Roosevelt. Who saves the economy? Clearly J.P. Morgan because he can, again, because he has the money. And, of course, J.P. Morgan says, here is the money. You are more than welcome to take it. Hurrah. And because J.P. Morgan saves the U.S., what is... Teddy Roosevelt's opinion of J.P. Morgan. He is a good trust. Right? His perception of J.P. Morgan is, thank goodness you owned all of these companies because you wouldn't, bail, you wouldn't have been able to bail us out. So J.P. Morgan, you're on my good list because you helped America out. Is that clear with everyone? 
because he helped us. I mean, how do you not say, and I'm going to bust your companies because then we're clearly just not thankful for anything. Last thing you should write down today, Taft follows him in 1908, and Taft becomes the second progressive president from 1908 to 1912. He was handpicked by Roosevelt, as can be seen in these two cartoons, where Roosevelt pretty much says, make this guy the next president. <laughs> <laughs> and in the other picture, where Roosevelt is a uh, little Bo Peep, and Taft is his sheep. I mean, just, just look at that face. He's really the best president. Yes. That's cute. Yeah, he was really happy. We'll end there today, folks. And then we'll talk about Taft. And then actually, we'd have not very much left to go. We'd have that, 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 that. Have a wonderful uh, weekend, folks. Make sure you guys... Uh